So uh, let me just take a moment to sort of introduce myself to you because I think I don't know most of you here. Uh, Doug Plata, I am an urgent care physician and got seriously infected with the space bug uh, back in 2012 and have enjoyed uh, every moment of the infection. How about you guys? Do you enjoy it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so let me also tell you, I've uh, developed a, a, a space advocacy organization called the Space Development Network, sort of a free-to-join organization. What we're looking is for people of very different sort of skills to go ahead and work together and sort of work on individual projects towards a, a specific plan, a plan for sustainable space development. Uh, so if you want to go to developspace.info, it's a rather extensive website. Uh, still a work in progress, but very extensive, uh, and you'll sort of see the concepts laid out there. And feel free to join if you'd like to. Okay, so let me just go ahead and give an overview. So um, I'm going to share with you about how this, how this came about. Um, it was a debate that I was in with uh, Robert Zubrin was, was on the panel in the debate, uh, and he brought up the issue of uh, greenhouses on Mars being able to have direct sunlight uh, whereas on the moon it has to be shielded, and, and so that has some pretty significant implications. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and sort of broach this issue. It's certainly not my area of expertise. If, it, if they taught this in medical school, I, I think I slept through that class. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and begin to look at some, uh, some designs and then really identify relevant factors, the, sort of the key things that uh, determine good choice of design. Uh, and then uh, start side-by-side -side comparing. I'm going to start trying to do apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Uh, and then finally, uh, and especially for this conference, begin to uh, look at, okay, what might the ideal uh, Martian greenhouse be? Okay? So, first of all, the debate. So, it was at this last ISDC, the International Space Development Conference. That's the annual conference of the National Space Society. And there was a panel of four of us. And the question is, uh, where first for settlement? Uh, I was representing the moon. Obviously, Zubrin's going to represent Mars. Uh, Al Globus was uh, representing um, equatorial LEO, uh, sort of low radi radiation orbit. Uh, and then uh, we had uh, Joel Surcell uh, representing uh, asteroids being the first place for settlement. Actually, he didn't, even he didn't believe that, but they wanted to be comprehensive. So we had those four uh, destinations represented. So Dr. Zubrin uh, brought out a point that I really hadn't thought through until this moment, and that is that whereas Mars doesn't have a very thick atmosphere, it does have enough atmosphere to largely or completely block the solar particle events from the sun, you know, coronal mass ejections or solar flares, um, so that the plants would be able to survive those events. And then uh, he claimed that the GCR is sort of the constant, sort of high energy but low dose or you know, low frequency of these particles uh, over time that the plants, by the time they're planted to when they're bearing fruit, uh, that they're not going to be killed by the GCR. So if that's the case, then you don't need shielding over the Martian habitats. You can just have a thin, sort of clear wall exposed to sunlight. You don't have to go through the process of using the photovoltaic cells uh, to, to bring the, the light in. Now, this was a, um, this is something that I hadn't really thought about, hadn't been prepared to respond to it in the, in the debate. And so during the conference, I started speaking with some other uh, people who are, um, you know, hydroponic sort of people. Uh, I did um, uh, get back with Dr. Zubrin and sort of began putting these, these ideas together. So this is the idea that something of this nature, uh, where it's fairly, you know, you can get going growing food right away. You just inflate this thing, uh, this habitat clear wall, and you can start start growing uh, the food there if you've got the water and the nutrients. Okay, on the moon, uh, they're not going to. The plants are. Uh, my understanding is they're not going to survive the solar particle event, so you got to cover it, which means then you need to somehow get the power inside. So the standard way of thinking about it is is photovoltaic cells, uh, and then you wire it into LEDs. Okay. So the downside of, of sort of the Mars greenhouse would be you don't have to ship the covering, the, the shielding. You just pile the dirt up. So that's mass that you, that's already there. But you've got to go ahead and ship these, uh, these solar cells, uh, the solar panels. And then there's also the, the energy conversion loss, right, as you're going from sunlight to 
uh, to electricity and then to, to powering the LEDs to produce the light, okay? So I was uh, thinking about it. Uh, I asked uh, uh, sort of my hydroponics friend in, in Zubrin. I specifically spoke with him about the issue of insulation, uh, which, which is a pretty significant issue. Is are you going to be able to, I mean, as cold as it gets on Mars at night, or how is that going to work? Um, uh, and what I would say is this topic is rather complex. As I got into it, I found it's a very fruitful uh, area to look at. But I think that this is actually a topic that I'm not going to be able to do justice here. I'll, I'll begin to address it. But I really think that at some point, at some conference, we actually need to sort of have a, a, a roundtable discussion, try to get to the bottom of, of some of these things. Because uh, if, you know, watching the news from Boca Chico, this, you know, these issues are going to become real issues, I think, fairly quickly. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But I began, as I looked into this, I began to realize that there are other factors than just the sunlight. Uh, if you're using LEDs in, instead of uh, direct sunlight, then you can actually start doing some vertical farming. And there's some efficiencies, some mass efficiencies to be found there. Um, also, uh, in comparing uh, for settlement, comparing Moon and Mars, uh, the sunlight is, of course, uh, about twice as intense on, on the Moon than it is Mars. And there's some, some other factors there, as I'll get into. And also, perhaps uh, the biggest single factor, uh, which I will get into in my presentation tomorrow, uh, but that is how fast you can do round, trip, uh, round trips to the moon versus Mars. And that has, uh, in terms of the rate at which one ship can do those trips, can make a huge difference in terms of how, at least how quickly uh, the, the development of both greenhouses but also settlements uh, would happen. So my presentation here, I'm looking at two basic questions. What is the better location, Moon or Mars, uh, for a greenhouse? And what is the optimal choice for a Martian greenhouse? So let's go ahead and get into that. I'm going to try. It's, it's sort of easy when you're debating to be able to say, well, my idea is better than this straw man idea. Um, we need to make sure that we are comparing uh, the best ideas so that it's a fair comparison. Uh, and to try to convert oranges into apples so we can compare apples to apples. So, what are we comparing? The standard way of looking at this issue is, uh, here on the left is the, is the Mars uh, sort of design, pretty straightforward. Uh, do notice that it's a single, it's a single layer there. Uh, whereas on the moon it would be something like this, uh, you know, uh, quite an array of, of solar panels that you've got to maybe ship there. Uh, and then habitats that you've got to cover with enough regolith to protect against the radiation. Okay? But also, as we're comparing the greenhouses, at what stage of development are we comparing? Because, especially in terms of ISRU, if you can produce plastics uh, on Mars, which I think we could probably do fairly quickly if, we, if you got the power, uh, and then on the moon, can you uh, extract the metal from the, the highlands uh, and be able to use that as, as materials, then it sort of is, is an equalizer. Um, so what I'm saying is because the debate was about settlement, I'm going to presume that the, um, the level of ISRU is, is relatively high because we're, we're into settlement by, by several years, a number of years. Okay? Also, uh, a common straw man argument against the moon is to say that, well, the, you have these 14-day nights on the moon. Okay, not at the poles, so we're going to be starting at the poles. So let's go ahead and compare the poles, particularly the so-called peaks of eternal light that you can get about 90% of the lunar day uh, sunlight. And the poles, you, you, can, you can have a million people um, uh, settle just the polar areas. So I would say let's go ahead and compare poles of the moon to, of course, the equator of Mars is where everybody says they want to start. Or I suppose SpaceX is looking a little north of there, but not terribly far north. So what are the notional greenhouses? So here's these diagrams. So this is the standard way of thinking about a lunar greenhouse, and that is you've got plants, multiple levels, uh, people inside, also shielded by the regolith, and you've got uh, solar arrays on top. Here's the Mars concept. You've got uncovered, uh, but you've got some air, so that's protecting it. You've got a single layer because of the sunlight. Uh, but you don't have people, and I'll explain why you don't have. It's because the people need to be shielded, so there is this issue of how do they work in the greenhouse 
when they're being exposed to uh, GCRs. I mean, that's, that's what the shielding is for, is primarily protect against GCRs because that makes up most of the radiation in terms of like millisieverts. So let's go ahead and start to compare uh, the location. Now, these are the notional, uh, the notional concepts, and I'm going to get into my recommendations, which are actually different from both the Moon and Mars. So here we go with the poles, the peaks, uh, peaks of eternal light would be the location on the moon, equatorial for Mars. For the, for the volume, and I'm taking an initial, a very initial coup of eight people, uh, for the volume on the moon would be about 20 by 20 meters by three meters. Uh, and, th and this is growing space. It's not walk around space, but growing space for the plants. Uh, whereas in Mars, it's gonna need to have a larger footprint because you have only, only one layer. Uh, the typical thing, or at least my design for the moon, uh, would be, a, would be a, a pancake sort of shaped with Kevlar tethers holding the roof flat so you can push regolith on top. The typical thing for Mars, like we saw in the, in the, in the drawing, would be sort of this Quonset hut sort of style. That's neither here nor there. You can switch one or the other. But in terms of the materials to, that you use inside and perhaps the structure of, of the um, greenhouse, well, this is where Moon and Mars is really fairly different. Uh, there's not, there, there is some organics. There's a noticeable amount in the ice and the L-cross results that are very useful, especially if you recycle. But you don't really have, you don't want to be producing large amount of plastics from your limited uh, carbon and nitrogen in, in the ice. Uh, rather, for the Moon, you want to go with metals, which we know there's unoxidized metals in the, in the regolith. On Mars, goodness, you got this wonderful, wonderful atmosphere. And by all means, let's use this along with water, you can produce polyethylene and all sorts of, basically every, every, um, every plastic. Um, for the shielding uh, on the moon, you gotta have uh, regolith uh, shielding from Mars. In this notional concept, you don't, you don't need anything for the plants. Uh, now for planting and harvesting, this, on the moon it's easy. They go into the habitat that's shielded and they can work in there. For Mars, you've gotta figure out a way to not have people go into the unshielded area, but you need to go ahead and get the plants to where the people are in their shielded environments, and I'll explain that. And then maintenance of pumps and stuff like that, you also gotta figure out how do you do that if the people cannot go into, go into the habitat. So let's, let's go ahead and get into this. Here's, here's Mars, and of course here's the challenge. People are living in the shielded area, but the plants are growing in the unshielded area. How can you do that? There could be a number of ways. There's this idea of that I've heard people say, we'll just have a sort of a sliding regolith shield and some sort of Quonset hut on rails that can sort of slide uh, back and forth. I think it's possible. I'm not really too excited about that because that is a lot of mass. You, you gotta build it up in the first place. It's a lot of mass. And then what happens if it goes off the rails or, or you know something like that? Okay, another way, uh, and I'm not saying this is comprehensive, but another way, would be sort of have a track system and then have, uh, sort of have um, uh, sort of, what do you call these things that, um, what's that? Well, pulleys, but you know, like they do in the shipping, you know, where, where it goes along crane, a crane, goes along a rail, drops down, picks up the item, picks it up, and then just wheels it right into to where the crew is. And now you can go ahead and, and plant or harvest whatnot, and then you send it back out and it drops it down the right place. So that is one way of getting around it. Um, another way, which is a real possibility, and that is just go full robotics, like you know, actually have our artificial intelligence systems going and planting and figuring out where, you know, where to cut and harvest and these sorts of things. But these things also need to be able to um, like repair pumps. Uh, and that can be uh, complex. Uh, I suppose maybe you could pick them out and then bring them in. Uh, you could have sort of a hybrid system, bring them into the crew and they could work on it. Um, so there's some possibilities and I'm not gonna uh, jump right now to saying which one I think works best. Um, now the, let me get into some of these, what I call relevant factors and just compare them side by side. So what about the lighting? Uh, so on the moon, I think if you're going to be going with electrical power, then you jump to the, like the magenta, the red, blue LEDs uh, and, you, and you don't use the energy shining the green light, which is just going to reflect back off the plants. Uh, for Mars, of course, for, for lighting, you use direct sunlight. For the power sources, uh, the standard way of looking at it is ISRU uh, at that stage of development of the settlement uh, and producing photovoltaic cells. Can we produce photovoltaic cells from 
lunar regolith? The answer is, it's practically already been done. Uh, Alex Ignatiev, researcher, has taken regolith simulant and has actually produced uh, functioning photovoltaic cells. So I think that technology is, is pretty advanced. Um, and then for Mars, of course, the power source is the sun. Now, here's where it gets quite interesting. Comparing the two destinations, the sunlight at the peaks of eternal light can get to about 90% of the day is you have sunlight. It really comes in at a um, sort of perpendicular, well, anyhow, you, you don't have panels pointing up to the sun because the sun is at the equator, so it's vertical. Um, so if you do 90% 90 90 of uh, 1,380 uh, watts uh, per, uh, per meter squared, I, I left those units out, then you get to about 1,240. Now Mars is in a much worse situation from a power standpoint because it is uh, about um, just right around 50% of, of the solar incidence, uh, plus you're blocking uh, you know, 50% of your hemisphere is covered uh, by, by the, the mass of Mars. Uh, and then you have these angles in which it's traveling through a lot of atmosphere in the early morning and the, in the late evening. And so I don't know the exact number, but I think it's about 250 uh, watts per meter squared uh, that you can get. Uh, when, you, when you run those, uh, you know, the comparison there, you can, you can see it's about, it's about 20% uh, of the power that you're getting. However, this is sort of made up by um, the conversion losses uh, of about 15% of efficiency on the moon with uh, photovoltaic cells, and then Mars, while well, you're getting the direct sunlight. Um, now, in terms of the plant configuration, I think pretty important on the moon, if you're, if you're doing LEDs, you can have LEDs down the plants, you can have essentially vertical farming. In Mars, if you're using the sunlight, it's 2D. Uh, so you're gonna have a greater footprint, more mass, in your greenhouse. Um, and then the substrate, I think in both places we're going hydroponic. That's, that's what I'm anticipating. Although certain crops, a few crops need, uh, need soil. Okay, so trying to compare apples to apples and please don't hold me to these numbers. I'm making a first effort at these. But how much, if we can put a, a factor, a, a number of saying how much does it benefit Mars that it doesn't need photovoltaic cells compared with the moon? And I'm going to say it's about 50% uh, of the total mass is represented by, by the solar panels. Um, but that's just a guess. Now, for the CO2 and, and nitrogen available in the atmosphere, uh, you've got, uh, in my perspective, if you can be recycling on the moon uh, using the local uh, nitrogen carbon in, in the ice, uh, then it's the, the amount of mass of the uh, recycling equipment uh, is probably a relatively small percentage of the overall mass of the, uh, of the um, greenhouse. Plastics available, I think, is a uh, considerable advantage of Mars. Um, uh, I'll, I'll be, you can go ahead and extract the metals, but I think producing things from metals on the moon is gonna be significantly harder than producing plastics on Mars. Uh, no regolith needed, well, it's a one-time thing that the telerobots put the regolith on, on the lunar uh, greenhouse, so I think it's a relatively small uh, percentage of the mass, but then the conversion losses are about uh, are about fivefold. Okay. So on the moon, the advantage of having 3D volume is you're not just growing one crop, but you're really growing as much as like three full-size crops. So let's go ahead and give that a 3x factor. The solar intensity is double. Um, magenta lights, you're eliminating one part of the spectrum, so let's go ahead and give it a third there. And then the daylight, um, meaning the 50% the plus the, the slight angles at the horizons, let's say 2.25%. Teleoperations, the moon uh, is within teleoperation, teleoperational reach of the Earth. Not so true for, uh, for Mars, so very arbitrary uh, tw uh, twofold there. But I think blowing all of this away is the quicker round trips. You can do 79 round trips to the moon with a starship than you can for Mars. Now, it costs more to do that many trips, uh, but you can grow uh, things on the moon much faster with a, a set fleet of, of starships. Okay, so can we think about uh, some better greenhouses? And I wasn't keeping my eye on the, um, the time, so let me go ahead and play through. I actually think 
that we shouldn't do photovoltaic cells. I think we should use solar concentrators. Uh, these, I believe, could be produced relatively early on both the Moon and Mars, uh, and um, the, the efficiency is, is much higher because you got light pipes uh, going in or, or, or fiber optic cables bringing the light in. So I would actually go ahead and replace it uh, with uh, solar concentrators. And for Mars, I would do the same thing. Thank you. Um, and if we were to do this, now these can be produced locally, so they're not shipped. You don't have that as part of your payload mass, uh, albeit you have the work of, of producing them, but that could be probably largely automated. In which case, if you can go ahead and start uh, shielding uh, the greenhouses and, and bringing in light in this manner, and you can, you can bring a lot more light from a larger area in through these, through these uh, uh, light pipes, uh, then you can actually start doing 3D uh, farming on Mars. Um, so here is changing those relevant factors by the, the different approaches that I'm talking about. So now you, your volume of growth on Mars is increasing. Uh, you do have the regular shielding. Now the crew can go into the greenhouse and handle things uh, themselves directly. Um, you have the solar concentrators. You, you don't have the conversion losses like you had in the photovoltaic cells. Um, and um, you still have the problem of the reduced sunlight at Mars, um, but it's significantly improved by being able to do the, the 3D, uh, the, sort of the vertical farming. So my suggestion is Starship, doing a lot of trips to the moon, but at the same time, starting to do the trips to Mars, and anything we learn on the moon is immediately applied to Mars. It's not one before the other. It is both at the same time, but, but using the, the lessons learned there. So thank you for your attention, and I'm open to questions. Um, so you mentioned the use of solar concentrators on Mars. So the classic objection to that is that unlike photovoltaics, they're completely incapacitated by a cloudy day or a dust storm, unlike photovoltaics, which still maintain uh, some efficiency in the event of a cloudy sky. Do you anticipate that as being a killer argument for continuing to use solar panels instead of solar concentrators in uh, Martian agriculture? Uh, thanks, Max. Uh, great question. Uh, I did look into that. I looked into the, the length, uh, the average length of the storms and how frequent the storms were. Uh, and um, the number escapes me, but I think it was about 1% of the, of, the, of the time would, would be blacked out by, by the storms. Some storms are large, longer than others. It's episodic, so while it may average right. out to 1%, it can definitely last long enough to lose a growth season. Yeah. Um, but and, unlike with solar panels, where you still, you still maintain enough power, uh, even, during a, even during most but all the worst dust storms to perform yeah. agriculture. What, what, I, what I would say is, I think under any circumstance, there ought to be enough supplies to bear with if things break down and whatnot. So if there's a storm, you start, you start consuming your, you know, you harvest early, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, and then you start consuming your, your, your dried goods and your canned goods and stuff like that. Um, so it's something that's relevant, but I think it's something that can be planned for. Thanks. I'll repeat the question. So if I understand what you're saying is a, a hybrid thing, we do have LEDs and, and some solar panels, or, or maybe just LEDs and a power system that you're drawing upon? You, you need power to, for life support systems, so yeah, so there's... The idea is to get you to the time of dust Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Question there? For, for Mars, uh, for the Moon. Uh, okay, what what is your source of carbon on the Moon? Let me absolutely dispel uh, this belief that, that's out there that there is no carbon or nitrogen on the Moon. Since two thousand nine, the LCROSS results we know that there's carbon and nitrogen on the Moon. There's nitrogen in the form of ammonia. Okay, that was detected in the LCROSS results, and that's a fingerprint. You know, that's a spectroscopic fingerprint. Uh, in, the carbon is in multiple forms. It's in the form of uh, so if you're producing propellant levels of, of, 
uh, if you're harvesting propellant levels of, of water, then you are producing, you'd have to ask Jeff Greenblatt because he's done this, he's presented it, he's done it. But if you recycle, there's, there's enough for, it's, he, he describes this much more than, than what you need. So, so it's, it's not a small amount, it's, it's not a small percentage of the ice is, is organics. Look, look up the L-Cross results, I encourage everybody to look up the results, become familiar, familiar with them. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Art and I are, were roommates last night. We're joking about being at each other's presentations and heckling each other. So I'm glad you behaved yourself, Art. <laughs> Was there another question? Yes. So on, on the lunar poles, you're going to have the, you know, the sun at a perpendicular angle, probably. It's Correct. It's going to be going around 360 degrees. So all those stories are going to have to collect in four or four days for the half of the rain. Have you thought about vertical farming? Are you doing like a silo type of situation? If you have all that side like, So, um, so, how, so how would you deal with shielding for those plants? Absolutely. Yeah. So are you, are you talking about using an outer um, shell of water to protect for columns? I, I see. I see what you're saying. Totally new idea. Uh, right. Right. Uh, so then the, then the question is, is there enough shielding for crew to work within there? Do you need crew to work within there? So what, I, what I'm saying is these, these are, it's a, it's a complex uh, field, and, and I feel like that the space advocacy community, experts especially, needs to sort of get together and hash through this, and because there's a lot of different I good ideas out there for, you know, for growing food. Um, I love algae. <laughs> Another question? Um, so there, there, there is space shoots that are uh, like shielding space shoots have a lot. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so as people are working within greenhouse, why can't they just be wearing suits to shield from the radiation? Is that right? Um, not a bad idea. Uh, it's just that um, you need about the equivalent of 20 centimeters of water to shield against solar particle events. So if you have a smaller shield than that, then when they detect, you know, when when they see the solar storm happening and the the radiation detectors start going up, uh, you'd need to get out of there into a storm shelter of, of, some, of some nature. Um, so I, I, and for the GCRs, uh, a lot of the GCRs are just too high energy. These things are relativistic speeds, uh, and they'll just, the, this little thing is just gonna punch right through it. Uh, so you're still gonna get the, get the radiation from the GCRs to, to a lar very large extent, like probably about 90% of the millisieverts, yeah. So poly polyethylene is, is really fluorine, yeah. So um, polyethylene with, with fluorine that's, that's embedded in it, it, it is, um, it's excellent because it has a lot of hydrogen. It has more hydrogen per, per mass of, of the uh, molecule than, than water. So it's even a little bit better than water. Uh, but again, if you take a look at the curves, let me show you the curves. Um, let me just, uh, just in answer to this gentleman, I've created a little uh, video animation. Of, this is an animation. Let me, uh, let me just scroll through here. Of a concept that I have for, for solar, solar drapes, and that is uh, at the poles of the moon, 
in which you have telescoping towers and you have suspension uh, lines between it pulling up rolls, uh, uh, drapes. So you have this whole wall of, of solar power or uh, solar drapes uh, coming up that would be minimum mass for support structure and uh, maximum power uh, production. So, but back to the radiation. Okay, so there's this graph right here. I wish I could zoom somehow. Um, so this is an important graph for radiation, and what it shows, this is Simonson et al., and what it shows is that as your thickness of shielding uh, increases, the amount of millisieverts uh, of GCR radiation is coming down, and it has this sort of curve. And you see the blue is the water. So if you have 20 grams per centimeter, which means because it's one gram per centimeter cube is, is the density of water, uh, then it turns out that it's, it drops the millisieverts, in this case centisieverts per day, but uh, per year, it drops it to about 50%. So just having your shielding against galactic, uh, I'm sorry, uh, solar particle events is enough to drop your, your radiation from GCRs down by 50%. So having that amount of shielding is very helpful. Um, but then you see the regolith, the curve isn't as good, but that means you just need more of it, uh, which means actually for the density, uh, you need about 11 centimeters of regolith to protect yourself from the solar particle events, and that's gonna bring you on down. Uh, uh, well, if you get up to 30 centimeters of regolith, that will get you down to about 50%. I'm sorry, what was your question? Yeah, question so uh, the question was about the greenhouse. So my, my guess is PEF is probably a slight bit better than the polyethylene, that's the orange uh, line there. And so to be able to get down to where you're staying within your career limits within a reasonable amount of time, especially if we're looking at settlement, then the amount of polyethylene fluoride shielding that you're gonna need is, is gonna be pretty substantial. It's doable. But frankly, regolith, just pour more, push more of it on well, let's talk later, yeah. <laughs> yes, well, you barely got it first. For the workers that are going into the Mars greenhouse, if they go out there at night only to do the work, maintenance and so forth like that, then they don't have any of the radiation. Uh, they don't have any solar radiation, that is true. Uh, galactic cosmic radiation comes from all, it's anisotropic, it's, it's from every, every direction. And that makes up, I think it's about 90% of the total radiation dose attributed towards cancer. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, <laughs> you're right. Uh, there's a question back here. Yeah. My best understanding is that, okay, okay, so in terms of like the living area, what percentage of the area needs to be growing food? Okay. I believe that it is about 30 to 35 percent of the volume needs to be dedicated to, to this very intensive hydroponic uh, growth system. And hydroponics, I mean, it's, it's pretty advanced level now thanks to the cannabis in industry. Um, and uh, you, can, you can get per, per cubic volume, you can uh, get much higher uh, production rates than fields, yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the liberty. For in, if any of you wanna leave, I mean, we're, we're done, but I'd just like to show you the uh, Space Development Network website. Um, uh, so just a little self-promotion here. Um, this is a website that is nearing completion, uh, and it shows uh, different aspects leading to settlement. So there's one, uh, the plan for sustainable uh, space development, uh, which gets into how the infrastructure can be established. Um, and at the next level, you can drop down, like here you can go to the radiation page. So it's a, it's a sort of an easy 
structure. Here's the crew and their help. So this gets into initial crew, which I think if we do it right could be extremely historic, whether on the moon or Mars. Uh, if we do it right, these people could go down a history similar to like Plymouth Rock or, or God forbid, Christopher Columbus, but the, the positive part of Christopher Columbus. Social status is, is fascinating. If you have people away from their family for more than 18 months, according to military standards, then they typically ship the family and, and establish families there. Okay, how are we gonna deal with that uh, when we're doing you know, 2.6 or 2.5 year missions to Mars or more than 18 month missions uh, to the moon? You know, uh, I advocate that we actually start look at thinking about sending families. If we're gonna be sending them there that long, but the families cannot include young children uh, because of the hypogravity issues. Um, and then, uh, and then um, some animals, a lot, of, a lot of fun there. And then just the reality TV, uh, not reality TV, but television series, virtual reality, et cetera. So the inspiration, dancing in three eighths or one six gravity is gonna be a new thing. I'm actually meeting with faculty, dance faculty, they're excited about this at the University of Arizona at Tucson. Just think about the physics of dance. When, when you know, what could you do in one, in one leap? It, it'd be more like high diving in terms of the number of things you could do um, while, you're, while you're up there. Uh, artificial gravity, the psychology uh, is interesting and dust mitigation. Uh, and then the international, now I, I'm, I'm oriented towards the moon and so this is, uh, what are all the things that could be done in terms of a very large international lunar exploration phase? And I think this is the intermediate step. I think when we talk about funding, uh, steps towards settlement, I think the, if we can get it low enough, and I think the Starship is gonna definitely be low enough, all, practically all countries, about two thirds of countries could afford to purchase uh, a seat for exploration. And I think they've got far deeper pockets than any one individual citizen in their country. And so I think this intermediate phase of international exploration is gonna be the transition, the way to increase flight rates, get price down to where private individuals can go. Achieving Earth independence is a project that some of us are working on, of being able to say, when we get to where there are physical resources on the moon and on Mars, how can we use those to be able to reduce the amount of mass that ships? So you get to where you're shipping people and electronics mostly, and, the, and for Mars, there are provisions on the trip. Uh, and we're making progress to the point we are actually beginning to demonstrate these things. Uh, and it's a very exciting project. If any of you could contribute some as aspect of that, that would be appreciated. Uh, space, uh, space policy uh, issues. Um, and then also, uh, I would like to see an analog base, a, a moon Mars analog base that would be more development oriented rather than exploration oriented. So, love to talk with any of you if you uh, would like to talk about these things. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Doug. That was excellent. Um, again, one last try. Is Suranjana Trivedi here? No. Okay. So what that means is you've got about 20 minutes to have a break. Um, and uh, we'll um, reconvene here at 5 o'clock on the dot. And um, hopefully our next two speakers will be here. <laughs>